Welcome back to Birds of a Feather Talk Together. Last week we talked about the brown-headed cowbird and how it lays eggs in other birds' nests. This week we talk about a bird that was majorly affected by this, so much so that it was on the endangered species list for nearly 50 years. One of the rarest songbirds in North America, the Kirtland's warbler is truly a fascinating bird whose small population migrates back and forth from the Bahamas to Michigan every year. We also learned that this bird was studied back in the 1920s by Nathan Leopold, one half of the murder and crime pair Leopold and Loeb. We actually learned that John and Shannon have a Kirtland's warbler specimen in the field museum that was collected by Nathan Leopold. This is a super interesting episode, and we actually kick it off talking a little bit about the whooping crane that was spotted in the northern Chicago suburbs recently. Okay, go grab your binoculars and let's get into it. We we know some people. There's a, a incredible guy who spent 35 plus years out at Morton Arboretum finding every single nest he could to oh, wow. study uh, uh, brown-headed cowbird parasitism. And so Jeez. there's some really neat data sets that people have gathered over the years with a ton of work because they're really interesting birds. That is Wait, awesome. Wait, so the males will help the female like identify? I, I, we don't, I don't know, know but, oh. but but I just like like that, that oh. one I was describing to yeah, you. Yeah, the two you saw I together. I watched that. I saw the male first and then he flew off and I don't know whether... I don't know. And, and, and yeah, would, was he scouting? Or, right. Yeah, and yeah. And you would think that like they wouldn't even at some level need a pair bond if if all that you need is is sperm from the male and then the female can go off and do all the work but right. but you still see males and females consorting together and that I don't is know. crazy all right well should we start this episode then yes yeah, sure <laughs> oh, i wanted to tell you first i got a message from kathy from skokie one of our listeners <laughs> and she said that she saw a black pole warbler in her backyard today so they're they're <laughs> yeah they're, here and they've come a long ways. <laughs> so cool. We went looking for them last weekend and um, somebody in our group saw one, but we weren't able to see it ourselves. Yeah. So we're still looking. They're still, have you, they're still have you have one on your life list yet? Have you seen one? No, mm-hmm. no. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. next week is, is definitely a good time to, to be on the lookout. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, before we get into talking about the Kirtland's Warbler, I thought we could talk a little bit about the Whooping Crane and Wilmette. So, John, you were kind of in the area. Yeah, it's kind of a sore point for me. Uh Uh (laughs) I was was doing a a, a census at the uh, Clark Street Beach Bird Sanctuary for the Evanston North Shore Bird Club, and I try to get out there right around dawn, and then I usually leave by about 6.30. And there's a bird chat for the North Shore with a bunch of birders in it, and I look down at it at about 6.30. 30 or so and there was a picture of a whooping crane flying along at Dempster just south of where I was uh, and wow. it, and so the wind was from the north that day and it was blowing pretty strong and and so the the woman who saw this bird walking on the beach happened to have her camera and took a picture, which was oh. awesome. And I was just thinking, I wonder if that bird flew by me and I didn't see it. Oh. <laughs> right, right. But then I got home and I was getting ready to go into the museum and suddenly the North Shore bird chat lit up with people saying there was one walking around in Wilmette. And it's it's just a, a wonderful story in the sense that uh, a number of the birders immediately went up there to look at it. They felt like the bird was in trouble. They called Brad Semmel, who's the Illinois uh, endangered bird, uh, endangered species coordinator. And he came out and they actually called the International Crane Foundation up in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And these birds are part of this population of whooping cranes that were hatched out in uh, Bar- around Baraboo. And so they, they, they're all color banded. They knew who the individual was. They sent one of their veterinarians down from Baraboo. She, uh, they got great pictures of this. She suited up in a white suit, which is the way these, they, they try to keep these uh, whooping cranes that they're raising this way from getting habituated to humans. And then she walked over and grabbed it. And they took it back up, and they're in Horicon Marsh up in Wisconsin. That's that's where they, they spend the summer. And this young bird was actually fine. He was just – it was just probably exhausted from fighting the wind. Mm-hmm. And so it was, a, it was a great success story, which obviously things don't always end up that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
That's awesome. That's pretty incredible. That is awesome. But I didn't see it. But oh. if you want to, <laughs> <laughs> there are. I, I, people always think, well, will I know it's a crane because there are other birds that are big and fly in the sky like herons. But you will know that it's not a heron. You, you can look at books to see they don't kink their necks when they fly. So it's you can tell them apart from other big birds that fly like that in the sky. How different is a whooping crane from a sandhill crane, just as far as like how they look? I mean, are they larger? Are they so they're they're quite a bit taller, uh, and they're white, whereas uh, with black wingtips. And sandhill cranes are are gray, and so when you finally see one, and and I've been in places with a population that was trying to be established in Idaho a, many years ago, where we went to New Mexico, where they spent the winter. And we were told to go to this field, and and because there was a one of the whooping cranes from the populate the flock was out there, and there were probably five hundred sandhill cranes in this field, and you could see this one big white neck sticking up out of the middle. Oh, oh wow! <laughs> it was not hard to figure uh, out where the so where cool. the whooping crane was hiding. Man, wow, that's awesome to see them together like that. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, it's, and 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 again, they they these birds are very closely monitored. Um, as they try to establish this flock in Wisconsin, the the other bird, the 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 actual uh, population that that has been out in the wild all along, breeds up in a place called Wood Bison National Park up in uh, North Central Canada, in a place that's incredibly hard to to access, and then winters down in Aransas National Wildlife Refuge down in Texas, and so those are the places to go see them. All right. Well, should we get into talking about our, our Kirtland's warbler? Yeah, let's talk about another formerly endangered species. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just like whooping crane. <laughs> so I wasn't familiar with Kirtland's warbler. When you sent the list of birds that you wanted to do, it was like we started researching the brown-headed cowbird and the Kirtland's warbler kind of were, you know, it seemed like there was a lot to do with each other. Um, but I think should we just kind of start out talking about the Kirtland's warbler um, in general first? Yeah, I think the, the, the first thing to me is it's one of the most range-restricted birds in North America in the sense that its breeding distribution is uh, in central Michigan. And for many years, that was the limit of it. And the population was really small. They're migratory. Turns out they winter in the Bahamas. There's a I heard a great story one time at a bird meeting by a guy named Harold Mayfield who studied them that might have explained why they, they didn't know where they wintered for the longest time and uh, and finally figured it out in, in the Bahamas. Um, and so, um, but they're also an amazing success story. Hmm. So yeah. they were on the endangered species list. Yeah. And so for a long time, it sounded like for 50 years and they're off it now, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. And so as far as like a, a, just them being a warbler, um, so how do they compare to other warblers too? It seems like they're, are they larger than all the other ones? They're, a, like? they're yeah, they're, they're big and they're, they're, they're just kind of a, a stocky bird. Yeah. And uh, what I'd say is other than that though, they're, they're just kind of a typical warbler. And what, what's amazing about them is they have this incredible habitat preference. And it took a long time for people to figure out exactly how to manage habitat in central Michigan. Um, they Turns out they specialize in jack pine, but they like jack pine that's regenerating. Mm-hmm. And that's fire mediated in a lot of that area. But one of the reasons why they got into trouble is once Europeans started moving into central Michigan, they didn't want to have fires destroying all the jack pine on a regular basis because that would burn houses and things. And so they started controlling for that. And that's one of the primary reasons why the population declined in the early 1900s. And Apparently they, ended up they in the... use large, they have larger home ranges than most warblers do in this habitat that, you know, humans are competing over. So if you make the places too small, you can't sustain large numbers of them at any given time so that part of the natural history of the birds contributed to their their vulnerability to uh to changing the landscape that dramatically and so they've all were they always kind of just contained to michigan then this wasn't like that they had a larger range i don't before they went into ohio in fact they were i the history of the taxonomy of them is really interesting because they have such a range restricted distribution they were not described 
they were late in the description of, of warbler species, which I also found pretty interesting. And uh, there was one that was collected, um, the first one that was collected ended up in a private collection and it, and the people who had it didn't know it was different. Mm. Uh-huh. And, and so it kind of sat there until the species was described 10 years after that. Um, and it was, I, and I was also curious, where did Kirtland come from? And the one that it was named after uh, in 1851 was on Jared Potter Kirtland's farm in Ohio. So that bird came from Ohio. Um, and he was a, a, an important person locally, a prominent uh, physician, naturalist. Um, so, you know, he, he, they named the bird after him and it was found on his on his farm okay uh, so but it's neat to to think about what's happened coming into today so so Kirtland's warblers don't breed in Ohio anymore there's probably not actually not that much jack pine in the lot I think of they I think they have expanded a little bit they have now absolutely into yeah the, so they breed in not, Wisconsin okay. okay yeah and northern Michigan and the UP where that's a new thing and in southern Canada and Ontario there are now Breeding right. populations. Oh, nice. Okay. So, okay. And but 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 this is mostly because of management of the habitat. Oh. Okay. With a caveat being that that they also realized early on, as they started monitoring these nests when the populations were really low, that brown-headed cowbird parasitism was really common. Oh wow. Okay. And they started a major program of trapping cowbirds in the area. Okay. And, and so. And that helped, but. Um, but now there's conservation efforts that friends of ours are involved with um, at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center to not have to, to use other ways of improving their population sizes without the artificial interference of removing cowbird eggs. Because that's not sustainable, right? It takes a lot of people uh, to go out and pull all the cowbird eggs out. So, uh, you know, you need to have other ways of doing that. And that has to do with habitats and, and making those things better for these birds so that you don't have to have human interventions. Because if it's the only way the species survives is through human interventions, even though it may be increased in numbers, that's not, that's not necessarily sustainable. So best to work with the natural history of the bird themselves and to work to help them. And that's how the so the it was it was a numbers decision that that allowed them to come off the endangered species list. They'd they'd reach numbers that were um, at a threshold that was above being considered. And so it's a, again it's a great success story. It's like bald eagles and uh, peregrine falcons and and. Uh, at the same time, one of the things that's stipulated in that legislation in the Endangered Species Act is that they continue to monitor the birds to see what happens, and so that's it'll be important. But but I still maintain that that habitat structure in that part of Michigan, which they now know how to do, I think effectively without again it's it's a it's a fire mediated habitat, and then. The next question will be like, what happens during climate change? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, will they have to move north? Can they move north? Mm. Um, I was also fascinated by some of the discussion that you can read online about why on earth would that bird nest um, where it does in central Michigan like that, and then winter in the Bahamas? Like that's not it's not common, um, and uh, the hypotheses are. I don't know how true these are, but it's a good story, uh, is that when the Ice Ages came, their distribution was confined to South Carolina, um, and that then to go from there to the Bahamas doesn't seem so crazy if that's where they were when that migratory behavior uh, started. So anyways, I like that story. Yeah. I think because it is a mysterious thing why would you do that yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not so mysterious if you were living on the coast there to think that that might be an okay place to spend the winter yeah 
we were looking at like their range map before when we were just researching and it was like such a tiny little dot down in the Bahamas and then up in, you know, Michigan and Wisconsin. And then there's nothing in between. And it, we were trying to figure out like, is there migration? I mean, when you look at other warbler migration maps and maybe this was just the way the map was, but you see like all the migration areas in between the two. And like, yeah. we were like, there's really we just these two dots. About, so so, yeah. so this, is a, this is an absolutely astounding story about technology and what you can do these days. So you mentioned earlier that Kirtlands is a fairly big warbler. So when they came off the endangered species list, one of the problems with the endangered species list is it's really hard to do research on birds that are on the endangered species list. And that's to protect them, which is perfectly understandable. Once they came out, these colleagues of ours uh, got permission to put uh, transmitters that would ping cell phone towers on them. And so they they would start in the Bahamas, catch birds, put transmitters on them, and take samples of blood, um, parasites, poop, because we'll get into that in a minute too. Yeah, one of our graduate students had to go down and work with them for as part of her dis- as part of her dissertation, and go down to the Bahamas to oh, do wow. field work in the, the middle of the annual winter. cycle of that bird was there was big chunks of it that were un- unknown. Oh wow! So so these these. Uh, transmitters that ping cell phone towers require cell phone towers and they have to be pretty close to cell phone towers to actually uh, ping them. And so they're not particularly good for what you were talking about, which is this area between the migration routes. But what they really wanted to know initially was when do they leave the Bahamas, which they could tell very quickly by the last pinging. Um, and then what they could do is set up a, a network of uh, towers in in Michigan and actually find the same individual birds. Oh wow! In the on the in the breeding season. So they season. rushed wow. as the birds leave the Bahamas. You rush to Michigan to set up the towers oh, so that wow. you can. Oh wow! <laughs> um, you and, can get there. You know, humans can move faster than a small songbird. Yeah, and and they yeah. and they they did try to do some things like they set up some towers in northern Florida, um, hoping to get the birds coming through on migration. And they did get a few pings that way. But but that was one year. They tried it a second year, and they didn't get any. And what I think that shows you is something that is really interesting that we still don't know enough about, which is that depending on the weather conditions, there's probably some plasticity in spite of the fact that these birds are shooting for this terribly tiny area up in central Michigan. For the most part, yeah, it's a it's a great story, and so uh, coming back to the research that was possible is, uh, I can't remember how that started. Whether our colleague Pete Mara called us or we called them, but we had a graduate student Heather Skeen who wanted to study microbiomes of things, and of migratory birds, yeah, to understand their entire annual cycle and migration. That, that lots of these things we. We know a little bit about what happens on the breeding grounds and a little bit about what happens on the wintering grounds, but we know nothing about what they do in between Mm -hmm. time. And one of the things that's really interesting is where where does their gut microbiota come from? What and how does that change? Because usually when we're going to study the microbiome, we're making assumptions or extrapolations from that bird's composition of bacteria that you got there and at that time, and we're extrapolating to that being a consistent thing throughout throughout the year so that you can compare birds that might have been, uh, the, sam- the poop samples might have been collected at different times or in different places. But it turns out that Kirtland's warblers are fascinating with respect to that because their microbiomes change. Um, from the wintering grounds to the breeding grounds. By the time they get to the breeding grounds, their microbiomes have changed. And then some of these birds were recaptured later on, and their microbiome was different again. So that's a really important thing to know, and that that kind of variance in microbiome, it doesn't, mammals don't work in the same way that, that birds do from that perspective. So you can, can't extrapolate from mammals to every aspect of of birds too so it's clear that there's you know and so what changes you can ask they change their diet on the 
they start eating blueberries, which is a reason to go to Michigan for sure. In fact, I <laughs> order frozen blueberries from Michigan because they're better than every other blueberry, even frozen, and it's not close. So, awesome. you know, they eat them too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, they'll actually they'll actually eat fruit in the winter, and then different berries. They're though. mostly in, insectivorous yeah. in the in the breeding season. You know, again, what what they were able to do with these transmitters is find these same individuals up in Michigan. And so uh, Heather would go with them. She'd put the bird in a paper bag and let it poop, and then they'd let it go, and she'd get a sample. And they were able to catch, I think it was nine individuals, multiple times in Michigan, too. So they caught it in the end of the breeding season, so she was able to get samples. So you know, the idea that you could take a bird that size and find the same individual on the wintering grounds and then twice on the breeding grounds. If you told me it was going to be possible, I would have laughed. And the real reason it's possible, actually, is because there are so few Kirtland's warblers in this world. Oh, Oh, yeah. So they had a really, they knew that they had a pretty defined area to look for them. And as a result, were able to find them. And that's why for most other species, a lot of birds get banded and very few bands get seen ever again. So, you know, you can't you can't do those kinds of studies on an individual in that way. That's why this project was so special because it's really rare to be able to to do that, to find bird. I mean, that's like winning the lottery. Awesome. The idea that you could find a bird like that. And I know they have a small distribution, but it's still pretty big when you're thinking of a person wandering around it trying to find a marked bird. So the technology is what enables you to find that bird. So. If you know where it's pinging from, you know likely it, depending on the time, where its nest is or where it's breeding. Well, and, and it's so. a lot of work because, again, it's just like it would be in a in a situation where they were trying to track somebody using cell phone towers. It's the same thing. You need multiple cell phone towers in order to triangulate well enough to find it. And so that's what they do is they erect these little mobile cell phone towers around these breeding areas. and 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 they end up finding things that, are really interesting that they didn't even weren't even thinking about, which is uh, one of my favorite things was they found out that mid breeding season some of the males actually took up and flew to Ontario from Central Michigan, and they still don't fully understand what they were doing or why. But there's they were moving into areas where there are other breeding Kirtland's warblers now in Ontario. And so what is, you know, what's the strategy there? It's almost kind of, I don't know, brown-headed cowbird like wandering around for something, you know, with, I, I don't know whether they were looking for other breeding opportunities or, or, or what. But, you know, it's amazing what you can learn when you can put some technology on these birds like that and then have it be stuff you can literally monitor through time. Wow. I think about it from the bird's perspective. If they're in the Bahamas and they get banded and they fly up to Michigan and they see the person, they're like, hey, you're here again? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, oh, no, that's I, a good point. I, I know actually. you. Yeah, well, yeah, what, yeah. Good, good God. Yeah. Well, I'm not we, coming back here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> blueberries that's... aren't that good. No. <laughs> I can find blueberries over there. Yeah. And these people are not there. <laughs> that's... <laughs> I don't know. If it were a crow, it would be worth uh, paying attention to because crows they would 100% recognize, recognize yeah. you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if a small songbird, a warbler, can what their discriminating power is. for. My first response yeah. is no, and, and yet yeah. it wouldn't surprise me that, well, certainly nobody's tested that mm-hmm. and oh, gone out yeah. and tried yeah. to figure that out. Yeah. Huh. That's cool. One of the things I was just looking online and just scrolling through Wikipedia and on the Kirtland's Warbler and didn't realize that there was a connection to uh, Nathan Leopold. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. I didn't know that the he was a... The salacious aspect of that, <laughs> yeah, of so, that bird. So he was one of the experts on them back in the 1920s, yep, it sounded was. like. So people should look up the Leopold and Loeb. Murder. Murder. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and the shenanigans that those two got into. And there are some interesting documentaries and books that have been written ab- about the two of them. But yeah, Nathan Leopold was an ornithologist. And wow. we have a specimen. That we, have a, we have 35 Kirtland Warbler specimens in our collections. And one of them is a 
Nathan Leopold wow. oh my gosh. specimen. Wow. So, you know, every time people ask us about it and but, I mean, he really, honestly, was a was an expert in their natural history and distribution. He, he was a so. he was a good and, ornithologist. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. wild! I had no idea. Yeah, once yeah. he got out of prison, he moved to uh, the West Indies and published some ornithological papers there. Wow! Oh, I guess I didn't even I realize that, that they went to prison. I figured I don't know. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's, that's no, for they, another time. Actually, <laughs> well, it isn't for another time. Actually, and and I know somebody who we can talk to about that because I, I. Just made aware of a woman who a, runs a bookstore up in Evanston who actually has Book done a and biography beginnings. on him. Oh, really? Wow. Very cool. That's fascinating. You know, it was, it was, uh, um, he was the one who discovered or described that the dependence on jack pine mm-hmm. and the cowbird parasitism. So, I mean, he was pretty instrumental in understanding the natural history of that bird when he wasn't murdering. Small children. Yeah. But... Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Oh, so we talked about, oh, I guess we didn't get that deep into the um, kind of mitigation and how cowbirds were actually like kind of caught and killed um, in the early stages of it. Yeah, um, it, tur- it turns out that, that, I mean, they'll come into seed and, and particularly, I think, early on in the breeding season. So they would set up these giant, uh, well, I mean, they're always moving around. So they set up these giant uh, uh, cages and they would catch several thousand wow. over the course of a breeding season. And and I actually, you know, I talked to, to um, the guy that headed up this uh, uh, project, um, Nathan Cooper, and and. He actually thinks they basically extirpated, meaning drove brown-headed cowbirds out of the central Michigan area. Oh they're they're much less common than they used to be. And my guess is that it's actually more along the lines of they've taught brown-headed yeah. cowbirds that this is not a particularly good place <laughs> okay. to try to do what you do as a brown-headed yeah. cowbird. But but it's – yeah, it's it's a – it was a real effort. And, and – Again, brown-headed cowbirds being brown-headed cowbirds, they're not discriminating on endangered species or common species. They're just out there parasitizing things. So there are big problems in central Texas for birds like black-capped vireo and golden-cheeked warbler, which are similar uh, in the sense that they have fairly low populations and local distributions. And so, you know, it's just it can be really hard on these endangered species if they're getting hit hard by by a, a cowbird mm. like that. I mean, if you're on the edge, it doesn't take much to tip you into the the serious decline that could lead to extinction, right? Mm. So it just takes a slight increase in cowbird population size in an area to have a outsized effect on on the birds that are nesting there. Wow. So, so the story I was going to tell about an AOS talk, the American Ornithological Union, American Ornithological Society talk that I heard by this guy, Harold Mayfield. He wrote a book on Kirtland's warblers back in, the, I think, the 50s or 60s. And he was saying that they didn't know where they they uh, wintered for the longest time, but that there had been a massive uh, fire that burned a large part of central Michigan. People died. It was uh, it was. Uh, pretty devastating for the communities. But the result was that suddenly there was this giant area of regenerating jack pine and the Kirtland's warbler population went up. And he was saying this was all storytelling in this talk that I saw him give, but um, he was hypothesizing that, that Kirtland's warblers thrived on having big areas of jack pine. And he was saying that there are plenty of areas where there are small pockets and there's almost never breeding Kirtland's warblers there. Oh. Huh. Huh. And so, again, these are these hypotheses that are kind of fascinating that you need data for if you mm-hmm. want to try to help the species recover. Yeah, mm. yeah. They're really cute, too. Mm-hmm. They bob their tails, so they're they're very cute. When they show up in the Chicago area on migration every once in a while, they make the birders flock to these little pine trees that they're almost always in. Oh, cool. So, awesome. cool. so have you seen one? Have you? There was one in Grant Park, which which interestingly enough was in this little area in Grant Park, and I didn't go to see it right away, and it hung around for at least a week. Oh, wow. And so really? I, I 
felt ridiculous going out there <laughs> after a week to see this bird that hadn't been that far away from the museum, but uh, it was still there. That's oh, awesome. Wow. Cool. That's awesome. I've never been to Michigan to to, to see the breeding ones. Mm-hmm. No. Me neither. Yeah. yeah. That's one, again, I've seen in the museum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not in real life. That's <laughs> Um, well, we do have one mailbag question. Do we want to, should we get into that or is there anything yeah, else sure. on the Curlins yeah, Warbler? All right. So this is somebody, uh, Josiah D., who reached out to us on TikTok and he said, do y'all think it's okay to use bird calls to attract birds? I use a quail call to bring in the California quails so I can photograph them. I also try it on lesser goldfinches too. Yeah. Notice the long silence. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a topic that people can discuss and people have strong feelings about it. Um, The data are actually kind of ambiguous. In other words, people have gone out and done experiments where they do playbacks in an area to see if it affects the reproductive success of, of the birds that they're doing these playbacks on. And much of those data don't suggest there's much of a problem with that, that the birds actually eventually get kind of they stop responding. Hmm. Um, but at the same time, it just, it's definitely kind of an obnoxious thing to do. Yeah. Well, and, also, if you're a university researcher, a lot of animal care and use committees, those are the committees and universities that have to approve you when you work on any wild um, organism and wild bird. They, their protocols will not allow you to. Uh-huh. Um, to do that. They'll reject your application for institutional support if you play back. And there's lots of places where people have been militantly against playbacks, mm-hmm. where if you went and played back something in that area and someone caught you, you'd probably be escorted away from uh-huh. that wow. space. So people feel really super strongly about that. I've seen really nice things because people have played sounds yeah um so i mean it's and there there are different ways to do it so for instance i do a pretty decent eastern screech owl and if we're doing a christmas bird count sometimes the only way it seems like you can get much activity or at least one of the ways you can get activity is if you do that in the middle of the day everything in the woodlot that you're in will actually come over and take a look okay and so is that hurting the birds? I guess, you know, you can make an argument that well, they stop foraging. Well, people say it's stress, right? So they, they're worried about stressing the birds and having too much cortisol in their bodies and that affecting uh, their health. Um, you know, life is stressful, though. Yeah. So hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you're a human or a little bird, yeah. uh, you can't avoid experiences well, that produce cortisol in your body. Yeah. yeah. And so so I, I guess I would say an answer to the question is a little bit of that is potentially okay. Um, and clearly it can be overdone and, and people should be really careful with it. So mm. it's common for people who lead bird tours who want to show people certain species to use playbacks to get them in. And there's been a whole bunch of controversy over over that too, and the overuse of of uh, recordings in certain areas. I remember the I think the first time we ever went out with our group, somebody did it, and it was just one time. And somebody that we were with was like, "I'm not sure how I feel about this." Yeah. <laughs> and so we knew right from I mean, the beginning that there's kind of most people feel yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. So, but but, you know, but it's I, like I, a, arguing about religion, and that's where it descends to pretty quickly when you start talking about that. The emotional aspect of it mm-hmm. comes out often in a very polarizing way to where you can't have an intellectual conversation about what the data might suggest. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. So it's interesting, you know, with, with some of the apps that are available, you can pull up a vocalization right. of almost anything and, and, and play it these days, which... Uh, again, depending on what you're doing in the bird itself, probably isn't bothering them that much. And yet at the same time, it, it's I always feel a little guilty about it. Mm-hmm. I make this trade-off with, with a bird, uh, Sora Rail, um, where 
I try not to play the vocalization, but I try to do the Im- imitation myself. And somehow I make myself <laughs> feel better that if I can get it call up because yeah. I'm imitating it, that I'm not really bothering it as much. Which I buy that. Yeah. I buy that. It's going to die of laughter. <laughs> yes. Or not call at all. In yeah. this case, it's like, <laughs> are there any, like, if you're going to do it, are there parameters, like, don't do it like a certain time of year. So that's a really good question. Um, some people will say they, they specifically during the the nesting season. So so when when the birds are pairing up, they're you know birds are setting up territories. A lot of species and and so they'll be aggressive and that can be not unreasonable because coming back to Shannon's point about stress, they're already moving around and defending territories. But once they're feeding young, you could make an argument that. Playing that tape is distracting the bird from doing the kinds of things that it needs to do to raise its young, and and that that could be problematic. And uh, so I think there are little things like that that are just sensible. And in the non-breeding season, you could make an argument that while they're under a lot of stress, all they're really trying to do is survive the winter. And so if you're doing a screech owl, really all they're doing is coming in and checking out something that they would check out anyways. And I don't it, think all birds would respond to even their own species song in the winter, would they? What what happens if you play them some things in the winter? I don't know that that's been rigorously tested. Some of them probably wouldn't respond. Yeah, it's... Yeah, so you can't just say, well, I'll go do it on the wintering grounds and think you can attract the birds so you can see it. Well, so I... it's not an easy answer, and you can probably feel our uncomfortableness <laughs> with with this, <laughs> even with our own personal behaviors and... And the thoughts on this have changed dramatically over the last 20 years. Mm. Well, and in, 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 in you mentioned uh, North America and migratory birds. If you're down in South America, a lot of these birds are on permanent territories that they inhabit year-round. And so is that different? I mean, it, it, it mm. could be. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks, Josiah, for uh, yeah. writing yeah, in. Good it, question. Yeah, it's a good, very good question. So uh, was there anything we want to say before we wrap it up John Shannon do you want to wrap it I just think uh, again Kirtland's warbler is is a success story and an example of where technology has provided some really fascinating things about its biology that I don't think anybody would have expected to be able to obtain um, 15 20 years ago Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate the support. We do have one ask. If you don't mind leaving a review and rating in your podcast app, that would be greatly appreciated. We're trying to spread the word about our podcast, and rating us always helps. If you have a question for us, please reach out to podcast.birdsofafeather at gmail.com. All right, have a great week. Love you all. Thanks. Thanks.